So um, our final presentation here, man, I am super duper excited about this because I get to talk about uh, my, my favorite single passage in the Gospels. And uh, I, I wonder if anybody could guess what that is. My favorite single passage. I'll give you a hint. It's a story. Does anyone even just have a guess what it might be? Okay, go ahead. That's exactly right. What else could it possibly be? That's what else could it possibly be? The prodigal son. And uh, we're not going to get, it's not where we're going to start, but it's definitely where we're going to end up. And uh, to me, you know, forgive me if this isn't the case with you, but I don't know how, how anyone who has read the New Testament couldn't have the prodigal son as like the top three, you know, maybe you have your own little personal favorite, that's good for you, but it's got to be top three in, in all-time favorite passages because probably more than any other single story or single passage or parable, it encapsulates the essence of Jesus' whole ministry. And, of course, he tells it right there in the center of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 15. And there's the three stories, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. And all three of those, Luke 15, just coalesce to make, oh, such a profoundly beautiful picture of who God is. And we're going to end up there. Our presentation here is titled, How Can I Have a New Start? And uh, I want to begin by asking if anyone out there is a runner. Am I the only runner? Okay, there's a runner. Great. Any other runners? All right, good, good. I just had a great run this morning, and uh, I'm right now in the midst of training for my second marathon. I've, I've run a number of half marathons, and I, I just love to run, but, but I'm in marathon training right now, so I've got to get out, and I've got to do what the, what the Australians and the New Zealands call the hard yards. You just got to get out there and do it, and sometimes you don't want to do it. You're feeling a little achy. You're feeling a little tired. You're feeling a little sore. You got to get out there and run. For those of you that aren't runners, let me just tell you, if you're able to run, you know, if you've got, you know, both of your knees replaced and you've got a fake hip or, you know, you have some other legitimate excuse, and don't say, oh, it's because I'm old, because that's not a legitimate excuse. It's not at all. In fact, there's amazing runners who run well into their 70s, even 80s and beyond. And uh, so I want to recommend running to you. It's a, it's a great thing. My only, regret about running, my only regret about running is that I didn't start doing it seriously until about four years ago. And I wish I would have started about 24 years ago or even earlier. I just, I just so enjoy it. It's such a beautiful thing. But as a runner, I subscribe to uh, several running magazines. And one of the running magazines that I subscribe to is called Runner's World. Uh, not the most original name for a magazine probably, but, but you get the idea. Runner's World. And uh, without exception, when the, the New Year uh, uh, issue comes out, at least since I've been a subscriber... It will have some, you know, for the January issue, whether it's January 2010, 11, 12, 13, whatever, it will have some cute saying that goes something like this, new year, new you, right? And the, and the idea is basically tapping in to a deep-seated human idea, and that's that we, we want a new start. We, we want to be better than we were last year, last week, last month, last whatever. We, we want to, there's the desire for improvement. Now, of course, in running, we want to run better, etc. cetera. And uh, it's not just the running, but other fitness magazines. You see this all the time. You look at any men's fitness or women's fitness magazines, and uh, it's, it's so often, you know, how to lose 15 pounds, the new you, how to have six-pack abs or bulging biceps or a flat tummy or blah, 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 blah. It's always appealing to some almost innate desire that we possess to be a better version of ourself, yeah? Whether it's, I want to be a better father, I want to be a better mother, I want to be a better uh, employee, I want to be a better boss, I want to be more physically fit, I want to spend more time with my family. It, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. I think it's something that God has instilled in us, and it's, it's because we come from such grandeur, we come from such glory, having been made in the image of God. And even though that image has been defaced and significantly scarred, there's still a desire in us to want to grow, to want to improve, to want to be, frankly, more like Him who made us in His image. So far, so good? One of the things that's very helpful in this regard, in our desire to improve, and our desire to, to be a better version of us, is, is it's kind of really neat the way that it works. It's that we need these sort of benchmarks or these, these um, almost calendar starts where we can say, okay, I, wanna, I need a new start. That was then, this is now. For example, in the, in the Hebrew calendar year, you had on the 10th day of the 7th month, the Day of Atonement. 
the Day of Atonement. This was the consummation of, of the, the annual calendar year for the, the Hebrew. It was, it was the biggest day, the most significant day, this amazing day in which the high priest would actually venture to go past the courtyard, past the holy place, and into the most holy place to appear in God's presence. And he was there as the representative of all Israel who was waiting outside. It was a time of great solemnity, certainly, but also a time of great joy because that veil had been crossed and they were standing right in the very presence of God, at least in the person of their priests. They were by faith because they couldn't all fit in there. Now, here's the interesting thing. That would happen over and over again. There wasn't just one day of atonement and that was it and then everything. No, there was ongoing. This year there's a day and this year and this year and this year and this year. God has built our solar system. He's built our own personal psyche around the idea that we need new starts. Today is going to be a better day. This is going to be a better week. This is going to be a better year. And this idea that, that God is a God of new starts is built right into the idea that, that God is love. For those of us that have children, I have two sons, and it's heartbreaking when you see one of your children fail or, or, or do something that they wish they hadn't done. Maybe they disobeyed and they're crying and they feel terrible about it and they're talking to you. And one of the most significant and both psychologically and spiritually significant things that we can do for our, for our children is not to hover over them and to lord that over them and keep continuing. By the way, this works for spouses too. To continue to remind them, remember when you, oh, I can't believe it. But sweetheart, that was 12 years ago. I know, but that was terrible. I was just recently having a conversation. I won't go into the details because I don't want the people to know who I'm talking about, but very close friends of my wife and I's, we were having a lovely conversation and, and something came up, uh, I don't even remember exactly what the detail was, but it was a detail about being left behind, you know, like having been forgotten and, uh, and uh, oh, I tell you, you would have thought that, that uh, this had just happened last week, the way that this particular couple that's good friends of my wife and I just started, I can't believe that you let, you remember that? You remember when you just left me there? Oh, you were off with your friends. You couldn't even, ah. and I was like, whoa, crazy. When did this happen? She's like, 12 years ago. <laughs> Right before we were married, I'll never for I was like, well, okay, I said, with all due respect, with all due respect, two things. Number one, that was 12 years ago. And number two, did you say this happened before you were married? And she's like, that's right, right before we were married. I was like, well, you still had a choice at that point. And uh, so <laughs> you, you married into this, and you kind of got to suck it up, if you don't mind. <laughs> Well, the point is this, you know, with our children and even with our spouses, one of the most empowering and significant things that we could do, both spiritually and psychologically, is to give them a new chance, to believe in them, to trust them, to give them a new opportunity. Jesus said it this way one time when Peter came to him. This is in Matthew chapter 18. And he said, um, Lord, how many times, you know, would somebody sin against me? He said, seven times, seven times somebody could sin against me and I'd forgive him. Seven times in a day, and I would forget. I am so gracious, I am so kind, I am so magnanimous and merciful. Seven times, and Jesus said, you're just getting started. I say to you, until seven times 70, right? 490 times, he said, seven times 70, which is, by the way, there's two significances to that seven times 70. One is, it's straight out of Daniel chapter 9, which is a prophecy that we've already talked about. Seventy weeks, 77s are determined upon your people. But even more than that, 7 is like perfection in the Bible, and 70 times 10 is like double perfection, and 70 times 7 is like, ah, in other words, if somebody sins against you a lot, a really huge amount of times, Jesus says, forgive him again, forgive him again, forgive him again, forgive him again. And what I love about this is that God would not ask us as sinful fallen human beings to do something other than what he himself would be willing to do. Wouldn't that be the height of hypocrisy for God to say to us, no, you should forgive, 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 forgive until seven times 70, but I am unwilling to forgive. How many of us in this room have failed and have fallen and have done that thing that we said we wouldn't do again? I wasn't going to get angry with my, with, my, with my son. I wasn't going to yell at him. I wasn't going to um, not spend time with my spouse. I wasn't going to you look at that internet website again. I wasn't going to whatever it was. I wasn't, I wasn't and then we find ourselves doing it again, doing it again, Doing, and the temptation for us is very similar to the temptation that Adam and Eve felt. Remember, as we, we, we talked about in an earlier presentation, they began to feel the guilt and shame from having disobeyed God and partaken of the forbidden fruit. 
And they made the incorrect assumption that when God came into the garden and started calling for them, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Where are you? They made the assumption that the guilt and shame that they were feeling was actually a reflection of the thought of God toward them. But they were wrong. This was something that they were feeling internally and God had actually come to announce good news about deliverance from the very feelings that they had wrongfully assumed were attributable to God. That's why they said, well, we heard your voice and we were afraid. And I can just imagine the heart of God thinking and breaking and saying, afraid? Afraid of me? Really? I'm your savior. I'm your father. I'm your friend. I'm your king. And how many of us have fallen and failed yet again, yet again, yet again, yet again, yet again. And the temptation is to think, well, I wonder if I've, I wonder if I've filled my cup up now. That was the last one. I'm sure that I couldn't possibly come to God again with that one because I've come so many times before. How many of us have had that experience before? Man, I've just failed too many times. Of course, the temptation is to feel that way, but we've got to go back to those passages, seven times 70. And again, if Jesus was asking that of Peter, who was a fallen human being, how much more would he be willing to do that for us? So God is a God of new starts. Let's start again. Let's start afresh. Let's get up. Let's dust ourselves up. Let's do it again. The Bible has this great verse. Great verse in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. I just want to read it to you. I've mentioned it here a couple times, but I want to just spend a moment on it. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. And here, speaking of falling and failing and, and making a mistake... Speaking of the righteous falling, it says this, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked will fall by calamity or into destruction. Now, I want you to hear that right there. Notice again, here's the seven, like the seven times 70. It doesn't mean he literally falls or she literally falls seven times. It means he's really good at falling. She's really good at falling. But here's where things get really interesting. According to this text, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, who falls more? More frequently, the righteous or the wicked? Yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? The righteous, because it says the righteous falls seven times, but the wicked falls what? Just once. He falls into destruction. Now, this raises a question, and it's a mathematical question. Why is it that the righteous continues to fall? Yeah, the point is because he keeps getting back up. You see, there would be one great way to ensure if you fell as a Christian and you fell in your walk with God and you fell in your relationship with God, there would be a great way to ensure that you'd never fall again. Just stay down, right? If you remain down, it's, it's just a physical truth that if you stay down, you can't fall. I cannot fall from this position, right? Falling only begins to be an option when I what? When I get back up. So here's the fascinating thing that it says there in Proverbs. It says a righteous man falls seven times again. And it raises, why does the guy keep falling? Well, the answer is, is almost mathematical. He, he, he falls because he keeps getting up. Right? He keeps getting up. And in many ways, that is the, the secret that unlocks the beauty of the Christian experience. Just keep getting up. Keep trusting. Keep starting again. Because the God revealed in Scripture is a God of new starts, of new beginnings, of forgiveness. And every time you're willing to get up, He will be there to receive you. God is love. Now, we've talked about the story here. And uh, we move from pre-creation through creation to the fall to covenant. The whole thing hinges on covenant. We've talked a little bit about that. I wish we could have had more time to really develop that theme. Maybe I'll come back sometime if they invite me at Hope Channel and do a whole series on the covenants. It's just amazing. But then even after covenant, you have, of course, the fulfillment of the covenant is in the Messiah. The church is established. But then notice it comes back to recreation. Even the whole plan of redemption, even the whole great story of Scripture, that's how we opened up by asking the question, what is the Bible? And the Bible is a grand story. It's actually lots of little stories. And, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about that a little bit, that everything from Daniel and the lions then to David and Goliath to Jesus walking on the water. It's, it's story after 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 story revealing the big story. And the big story is that God is in the process of keeping covenant with humanity and saving all who will be saved. Isn't that a beautiful story? And the real beauty of the story to me is that God is going to start this thing over. The Bible opens in the Garden of Eden with a perfect people in perfect communion with a perfect God in a perfect environment and living in perfect relational integrity. That's exactly how the Bible ends. Genesis 1 and 2 is, is Eden. Perfect people, perfect God, perfect environment, perfect harmony, perfect relational integrity. And then we go through the whole Bible, the fast version. And we come down to Revelation 21 and 22. By the way, that was the whole Bible right there. 
We come down to Revelation 21 and 22, and you know what we see? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Or not Adam and Eve, but all of Adam and Eve's descendants. In the Garden of Eden, right? Perfect God, perfect environment, perfect communion, living in perfect relational integrity. In other words, God basically restarts the whole thing. And he restarts it by his love. He restarts it by his goodness and forgiveness. He restarts it, he restarts it by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which is the thing that connects us. And we're going to talk about that at the close here. That reconnects us to God. It gives us a restart. Right? You remember the old... Uh, some of you might still use uh, PCs. I'm, I've been an Apple guy now for years and years and years. So for... My, my computers don't really crash. But back in the day when I used PCs... <laughs> this is not an advertisement, by the way. I'm just telling you the truth. This is my experience. Back in the day when I was a PC user... I feel like I'm getting in trouble with some of you. But when things would sort of like, you know, go pear-shaped... Um, you'd have to hit... Do you remember... Control, alt, delete. Like, start over. Well, God has built control, alt, delete into the system. If, if right here, the whole plan of salvation, God basically says, let's reboot, let's try that again. And the Bible is filled with this. The Sabbath is a control, alt, delete, if you will, for every single week. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. It's a weekly restart. Just like we mentioned the Day of Atonement was every year, let's do that again. Let's do that again. Let's let this one be better than last one. And human beings, just mentally, there's a, there's a great saying that if you aim for something, a goal, if you aim for a goal, you might hit it. And if you aim for nothing, you might hit that too. Right? What, human beings, most of us, many of us, love goals. We like, we like the idea that that, that that measured off. That was the end, and now this is a new thing. This is a beginning. Baptism is one that I didn't even put up here, but baptism is a great example of that's what was and this is what is, right? And there are people that I meet all the time and, and they misunderstand the nature of baptism and they'll come and say, Pastor Asherick, I need to be rebaptized." And there are some people that do need to be rebaptized. They've made, you know, some really serious mistakes or, or they've, they've walked away from the Lord for a number of years or whatever it might be. I'm not saying that rebaptism is never appropriate, but most often when people come to me and say, I need to be rebaptized," and I hear them out, I'm like... You don't need to be rebaptized. You just need to believe in the experience of your first baptism. Jesus, on one occasion, was washing the disciples' feet, and Peter, you recall, protested and said, Oh, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And uh, then he's like, Well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. In other words, if you don't understand what I'm doing, I'm here to serve you, Peter. You're not, it's not about, the story is not about you serving me, it's about me serving you. And when Peter kind of figured out that one, he said, okay, well, then maybe you could wash my hands and my feet. Just give it, wash everything, right? And, and Jesus' response was, no, he that is clean, he that is washed is clean already. You only need the dust washed off your feet. What a beautiful ceremony. What a beautiful idea that, that when you've been washed in your baptism experience, that was then. This is a new start. Just like that Runner's World magazine, new year, new you, right? You could say new birth, new you. We, a new start. And that's what happens in the foot washing service. It's what happens at the Sabbath. Right? Every week, let's do this better. Every week, I want to... This week is going to be a better week with my children, a better week with my wife, a better week with my Lord. And you might fail, you might fall, but we have these, these demarcations whereby we have a new start every time. The flood, of course, is another great example where God could have just easily said, okay, this, this thing is not working out with humanity. These people are so self-centered. The thoughts of their, their mind are only on evil and violence continuously. He, instead of hitting control, alt, delete, he could have hit off. Yeah. Yeah. Off, it's over. Okay, I'll get back to my angels or whatever it might be. No, the flood, restart, start again. And by the way, there's a lot of theological beauty to that. If time allowed, I could show you how Adam was was the first man that God had created, and then Noah becomes like a second Adam. It's a very interesting little parallel there in Genesis 1 and Genesis 6, 7, and 8. But one just very quick one is that in the beginning when God created uh, the, the, the earth, it says that he separated the waters above from the waters below, right? He, he made a firmament, a space in the midst of the heavens. That was the way that God created. So as it were, he slid his hands in and made a space, and then he begins to go through the rest of the creation, and then he makes... Noah, or excuse, Adam, and he makes Adam out of the dirt. Right? So far, so good. So an interesting thing happens. After the rebellion of Adam and Eve, and then the subsequent rebellions that take place, an interesting thing happens. God sends a flood, and the Bible says two things. It says the windows 
of the heavens were open and the fountains of the deep were open. Now watch this. What that means is that God essentially, to use a picture, he pulled his hand from here so the waters came down from above and he pulled his hand here and the waters came up from below and the earth became, watch this, a watery mass again. Well, that's exactly how it had begun. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. So God begins in, G in Genesis 1 with a watery mass and he puts his man, Adam, who was a man of the earth. This is my guy. And in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, after the flood, where God makes again a watery mass, he takes his man Noah. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 9 that Noah, your Bible probably says Noah was a farmer. But literally what it says in the Hebrew is Noah was a man of the earth. You know what that means? He's like an Adam figure. He's like, and there are so many amazing parallels. What God is doing here is he's starting over. He's starting over. He's starting over. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, man, the Bible is filled with stories where these guys basically blew it, particularly Abraham and Jacob. They were better than Isaac at blowing it. And, and, God, and God gives them another try. In fact, there's two stories in the Bible about Abraham lying about Sarah being his sister. I mean, two, not one. Not, he tried that, and then he got caught, and then he did it again. Do you ever feel like that? Like, man, I did this last time. Didn't work that time either. Uh, you've probably heard the definition. You've probably heard that classic definition of insanity or stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again, thinking that you'll get different results, right? Well, the Bible's filled with two stories where Abraham, Abraham said, no, she's my sister. And that did not work out. And God was like, don't do that again. And then another time he said, no, 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 she's my sister. And God's like, did, have we, haven't we been here before? <laughs> You have the story of Moses. This is a great, one of the great stories of redemption in the Bible where Moses tries to bring deliverance by physical violence. We just mentioned that very briefly, um, very, very briefly, the whole idea of superheroes, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Iron Man, and the world is just infatuated with these superheroes. And the interesting thing is, is that it's actually tapping into something deep inside of the human psyche. We know we're in danger. And we have a sense that we need a savior. But all that Hollywood can promise and all these superheroes can promise is a physical deliverance from a physical problem by physical violence. But the real savior that we need is a spiritual deliverance from a spiritual problem by his spiritually beautiful character. Absolutely awesome. And in the case of Moses, when Moses realized that he was, in fact, uh, called by God to be the deliverer of Israel, he tried to do so by violence, and he actually became a murderer of another man. And then God, rather than saying, well, this guy, throwing him out. No, 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 no. He, he felt perhaps thrown out for a while because he went through a long period of 40 years, and then God says, you know what, let's try that again. Well, I mean, what a beautiful story of redemption. What a beautiful story of God allowing us to revisit those failures in our life. Now, here's a really cool thing. My last name is Asherick. And uh, it's a cool last name. I'm happy to have it. But it's not my birth name. My birth name was a much better name for a preacher, by the way. My birth name was David Cross. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Wouldn't that, I mean, that is, that, that, I mean wh wh what, what better name for a preacher? I would just love to have that name. The only problem was is that it was the last name of somebody who basically stuck around for two weeks and then ditched both me and my mom. So I don't want to bear that name, right? So I was adopted, and then I had a second last name, and then I was adopted again. And I was adopted the, the, the third time, or the second time. I got my third last name. When I chose, and my brother chose, my mom said, look, you guys are old enough now, uh, 11 and 12, you make your own choice. If you want to be adopted by Richard, and we didn't right away. We waited, we sort of, you know, who is this guy? You know, we were sort of biding our time because we were accustomed for men that come, stick around for a little while, and then leave, you know, abandon ship. But I tell you, now they've been married, oh, man, I'd have to do some math on that one, but uh, that would be 11, 30 years, 30 plus years, and he is just a wonderful, amazing person. Now, here's kind of the story behind all this. My legacy as a dad, uh, my legacy in terms of fathers is not a particularly good one. My, it became good later as I got into my teen years, but my early years were, were not good. I had no real dad figure. And so I decided that, that if God gave me the opportunity to become married and to have children, I was going to do better. I was going to have however many children God gave me. I was going to be the best father that I could be to them. And so I want my children, if time should last, for them to become the best fathers that they can be. So here, even in the familial cycle, God gives us a chance to revisit past failures, to break those cycles of, 
of, of dysfunction and to establish new legacies within our own families. Isn't this beautiful? This is the God that we serve. New opportunities, new invitations. Let's try that again. David is another good example. I mean, David goes out and, and takes Bathsheba. And if you read the accounts very carefully, David did not merely have consensual sex with Bathsheba. He raped her. I mean, David clearly violated her in a way that, that was, was not just consensual between the two of them. He took her. The Hebrew word is he harvested her. And the Bible goes on and continues to call her Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. The even after Uriah was dead, not only did he take Bathsheba against her own uh, uh, will, he then murdered her, his husband. I mean, this is like, what? Who is this guy? Who is this villain? Who is this? Well, he's a man after God's own heart. He didn't have God's own heart when he was violating Bathsheba or murdering Uriah, but he was a man after God's own heart in that when he saw the total, full failure of his way, he was broken. I mean, that's not even the right word. Devastated and in a strange kind of way. Actually, you and I are huge beneficiaries of David's mistake in this sense. Not that God wanted it, not that God, allowed, not that God sanctioned it or that he in any way endorsed it. But so many of the most beautiful psalms are born out of David's brokenness, David's failure. I tell you, I, would, I might have given up on the Christian faith. Possible. I'm not saying I would have. It's possible that if Psalm 51 didn't exist, that I might have cashed in. There have been so many times where I have failed, where I have failed, where I have made complete shipwreck of a situation, and I just go back to Psalm 51, and I think, man, if David could get back up, if David could, I can, I can get back up. If he could trust in the goodness of God, I can trust in the goodness of God. And like that, like that righteous man that fell seven times, I can get back up. Yeah? And, and the Bible is just filled. Every one of these you could do a whole series on. God started over with Elijah when Elijah ran fleeing from Jezebel. And, oh, that's one of my favorite stories because Elijah, you know, he's the man of the hour, the tower of power on top of Carmel, and he's showing down the priests of Baal, and the whole thing is just beautiful. And then he gets word that a girl is out to get him. He's like, ah, a girl, and he flees. And he flees into the wilderness, and it's amazing. This story is so awesome. You need to go read it again in 1 Kings chapters 18 and onward. God shows up, and he shows up in kind of a strange way. First, there's this great whirlwind and a mighty wind, and it says God wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake, and it says God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a great fire, and it says God wasn't in the fire. And here's Elijah the prophet who'd been walking like this with God, but he feels now, I must have. I must have so failed God. I must have so fallen. I must have made such shipwreck that there's no way God could start with me again. You know what? He was so despondent that he was suicidal. The text actually says that, that take my life from me. Let me die, he says, because I'm no better than my father's. He was feeling so depressed, so dejected. And just a word about that to those of you that, that might have an inclination or a propensity to depression. Use, let me just say a word about that. First of all, if it's clinical depression, you need to see a doctor. You need to take care of that. My, my mom has suffered from clinical depression her whole life, and she has to see doctors because of various imbalances, just chemical imbalances in the brain. The brain is an organ like the liver, the heart, or whatever. But, but if you just find, you know, that you often feel sorry for yourself, it's not clinical or chemical, or you just kind of, woe is me, woe is me. I can tell you there is help for you, lots and lots of help. And the first thing that you need to do is to believe the goodness of God, believe the promises of God. Just believe it. That alone, a sense that you don't have to win God's affirmation. You don't have to win his attention. You have it because of who you are, not who you want to be. Do you hear that? In fact, the only thing that will ever give us confidence to try and become that better person that God has called us and created us to be is a confidence that we presently have a standing with God based on the goodness of Christ and what He has done for us and in us and not based on anything we will become. Do you hear that? God loves you and accepts you as you are. Is He calling you to higher ground? Yes or no? But if you're always feeling, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not whatever, and then you have the whole media that comes and says, you need to look like this, you need to act like this, you need to dress like this, you need to talk like this. So we be can begin to have a really low self-esteem or a self-evaluation. I'm not one of these guys that says, you need high self-esteem, you need to feel good about yourself. In a sense you do, but the thing that should make you feel good about yourself is, is not anything that you possess inherently, it's what God
has done for you and in you. You are unique and special in the eyes of God. And that, if you can just turn that switch in your mind, it will have huge positive psychological spiritual benefits and you'll stop trying to be something that you're not yet and be satisfied with what you presently are not in a sense uh, of satisfaction in terms of laziness or or here I am a resignation but but God loves me God loves me and he calls me to be a better version of who I am but the person that I am is somebody that God loves and some of you had parents or teachers or others that that said you'll never be good enough and 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 you always felt you had to win your parents affection or win your dad's affection or 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 your teacher's affection or even your brothers and sisters I want you to know you don't have to win God's affection you have it you are made in the image of God and he loves you as you are. Does he want you to be the better, the best possible version of you? Does he want me to be the best David Asherick that I can be to his glory? Of course. And he wants the same for you. Not the David Asherick, but the fill, fill in your own name here part. Right? And, and that will happen. But at every step of the way, we can rest in the absolute assurance of God's goodness toward us. Yeah? We can rest in that where we are right now, and so can you. In fact, the only thing that can give us moral power to become a better person is resting in the, the fact that we have right standing with God right now. I want to say that again. The only thing that can give us moral power to become a better person is a confidence that we are standing in right relationship with God because of Christ right now. You with me on that? So there's Elijah in the cave feeling depressed. And, and this story is so awesome because once God comes, not in the fire, not in the earthquake, not in the wind, but in a still small voice, he whispers to him. And they have a little conversation. Elijah, what are you doing here, man? What? What? Come on, it's just a girl. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? What are you doing in here? And it's so awesome because when Elijah comes to himself, when he repents before God, go read the account. It's amazing. The moment that Elijah comes to himself, do you know what the next thing that God says? It's just awesome. God says, okay, we've got to go anoint this king. Okay, now don't miss that. He wasn't like, okay, now woo, you're, we're going to just have to see, well, I'm putting you on probation and we'll see how things go. No, it's like Elijah is God's man, he's God's man, he's God's man. Elijah, Elijah goes through this great big depression hiccup and he, he comes to a realization through the still small voice and then God says, okay, are we back? We good? Okay, let's go. <laughs> are you with me on, I mean, that's the way that God works. That's exactly how God works. He did the same with Peter, who's my next one. He was the one that was coming to my mind. Peter, you know, oh yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And then he goes through that rejecting, you know, re re denying Christ, rejection. And then he comes back up. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. You sure you love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you love me? Yeah, I love Okay, let's go. <laughs> Feed my sheep. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? That's how God operates. It's not this like, you know, holding us in contempt and we'll see. We'll see how this goes. You better be on your best behavior kind of a thing. I mean, God longs for us to be the best version of ourselves. But in instance after instance after instance, Paul, who was a murderer and a persecutor, becomes Saul. Or Saul, who was a murderer and a persecutor, becomes Paul, the great evangelist. Mary, who failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. And Jesus kept trusting her with her freedom. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and, he kept trusting her with her freedom. The Bible actually goes so far as to say that there were seven demons cast out of this woman. That means, and it doesn't mean at a time. It seems to mean on successive occasions. In other words, failure, and a failure, and a failure, and a failure, and a failure. But she never got to that threshold of 70 times 7 in a day. Right? You might have failed a bazillion times at something. But just do the math and say, have I done this 490 times yet today? No. There's still hope for me. There's still opportunity for me. I can still come back. And then I want to go to the prodigal son. I want to spend some time there. Go with me to Luke chapter 15. I want to really spend some time on this because there is so much here, as we mentioned at the outset of this, God is the God of new starts. Jesus here encapsulates his whole ministry, his whole mission in one story. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Many of you have heard whole sermons on the prodigal son. But I want to point out two fascinating, actually several, but two primary fascinating things. And many of us know the story, so I'm just going to kind of read through it quite quickly, beginning in verse 11. It says, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to to him his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son uh, gathered all together and journeyed into a far country where he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. That means lavish living. But when he had spent all there, uh, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine, which was basically Jesus' way. Whether, the, whether Jesus was telling an actual story that had happened or he was just making the story up for, to kind of create an illustration... 
The whole point about the swine is like the lowest of the lowest of the lowest that, that, a, that a Jew could go for, for a number of reasons. First of all, he's in a far country, so he's in a non-Jewish land. He's in a Gentile land. He joins himself to a citizen of that country, which means he's now working for a Gentile, which is already, this is problematic for a Jewish thinking. But now, he's not just, he doesn't just have a, a job. He's not the accountant. He's not the physician. He's not, he's the, he, his job is to feed the pigs. So what Jesus is doing here is he is creating the, the worst possible situation. In, to the audience to whom he was speaking, this, you cannot get lower, it cannot get more depressing, it cannot get worse than this. He feeds the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and, no one, and yet no one gave him anything. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he had a realization when he reached the lowest of the low of the low, when he came to that place where he, he thought about something, he said this, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and yet I perish here with hunger? Now, I like to imagine this. Check this out. I like to imagine that he's sitting there. Maybe he's feeding the swine, and he has this realization while he's sitting. And uh, follow this. You'll see why this is important. He says in verse 18, he's sort of now thinking to himself. He's, he's having this realization, man, what am I doing here? Why am I in this far country working in this Gentile situation? This is a bad situation. I'm feeding pigs. i got to get out of here. There are hired servants in my own dad's house that are better off than I am right now. And so he hatches a plan, right? And I can just see him sort of sitting there hatching the plan. And he hatches the plan. And Jesus here, as he tells the story of the hatching of the plan, the way with which he would approach his dad, he's very specific about the details. And I want you to note the details. He says in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Okay? So he's sort of rehearsing his speech. He's sort of playing it out in our mind. And many of us have done that before. When we have a difficult conversation or a difficult situation coming up, we'll rehearse it to get ready for it. Man, what am I going to say? Oh, I know what I'll say. I will say to my dad, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say, now watch this. There's two parts. How many parts? Two parts. He says, I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's the first part. So the first thing I'm going to say to my dad is, Dad, I have sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you, and I'm not even worthy to be called your son. So far, so good? That's A. That's the A part. Here's the B part. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, you'll notice that that word servant comes up here. It's already occurred when he has the realization, my father's servants have, are better off than I am right now. So he says, I'll go back and I'll say, Dad, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. A. And B. Make me like one of your hired servants. Okay, so now, verse 20. So he arose and went. That, that's what makes me think he was sitting. He was thinking about, how am I going to go back to my dad? How am I going to do that? And it, remember, it was a far country. So he makes up his mind. He gets the resolve. He says, well, this is a dead-end situation for me if there ever was one. I'm going to do it. So it says in verse 20, so he arose, watch this, and came to his father. Right? So he's, he's setting off on the journey, and he's, he's coming to go see his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. Now, I love this part, and I allow my sanctified imagination to kind of go a little bit here. He was, he was a long ways off. Now, the father has no, you know, he hadn't sent a text or an email that he was coming. So he doesn't know. that He doesn't know that the son is coming. But the son must have had, as, as many of us do, a familiar walk, a familiar gait. Right? Isn't that true? Um, we, you know, I sometimes give my wife a hard time because I say that sometimes she walks a little bit like a duck. I, I give her a hard time. I say, sweetheart, put your feet more straight together. She, she walks a little bit like this, right? She's beautiful, by the way, when she does it. Most beautiful duck. And maybe you've seen somebody that... <laughs> inside joke with my wife and I. And, uh, but maybe you've seen somebody who's a pigeon. You got these people too, right? My friends call me a bear when I run. They say, you run like a bear. <clears throat> You know, and, and people just kind of have, you know, they kind of have their own, people just have their own way of walking. Even if you could just see a silhouette of them walking, you could kind of know, I, I, oh, I know who that is. Is that true? Right? I got a good friend of mine, I won't say his name, but he, he, he just, shoulders are forward and is, is just kind of like this. <laughs> just like that. And I, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, good to see you. And he's like, shut up, shut up with that. Because he, he's, he's, his, his posture makes mine look good, which you know he's got bad posture. A couple of years ago, I went to the University of Oregon, or last year, actually, I went to the University of Oregon, and I had them put those little, um, 
I don't know if you've ever done this before, but I got a running analysis, and they put these little dots all over me, these uh, uh, electronic dots, and then they put me on a treadmill, and they had all of these cameras surrounding me, and it took pictures of me running, right? It's the same thing they do for, like, computer games. And so I ran for a long time on this treadmill, and they took a, a computer-generated image of me, and or, uh, they took pictures of me, and then they created a computer-generated image, a CGI. And uh, it was really kind of interesting because it was just a stick figure running so they could basically see, you know, do I lean to the right, do I lean to the left, do I have, you know, any imbalances in my running stride. And uh, even with this little stick figure, I could look at that and be like, that is totally me. <laughs> I could just look, I, that's how I run. That looks just like me. If a stick figure was running, I, I would say, that's me, that's my stick figure. <laughs> so the prodigal son is a, is a long way off and he must have had a certain way that he was walking. Because the father would have been accustomed to seeing people come down whatever that was, that ridge, or, or down through that valley. He would have seen people. But when he saw this one coming, he said, I, rec I recognize that walk anywhere. It's my son. And the Bible says that he raced off. Look at this. This is just absolutely awesome. He met him a, a, a long way off. Look at this. It says... Um, uh, what verse am I in here? Verse 20. He says, But when his father saw him, he was still a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran. Isn't that awesome? That's the biblical picture. Jesus is telling the story and every detail is significant. The father runs to the son who is returning. Runs to the son who is returning. He doesn't just run. Look at this. He fell on his neck and kissed him. The son has been waiting, uh, you know, anticipating this moment, fearful of this moment. You know that he's fearful of it because he rehearsed the thing he's going to say. He wants to be sure he says just the right thing because the implication is if he said the wrong thing, he could be out. I've got to have just the right words. I've got to say it in just the right way. If I'm going to get back into my father's good graces, I've got to say it. But the father has none of this. The father sees that familiar gate coming down the ridge and he races to him. And for all, the son would have known, oh, no, this is not looking good. And the father runs and falls on him, not to tackle him to the ground and say, what are you thinking, boy? No, but he falls on him and he kisses him. I was raised, but my, my third father, <laughs> can you believe I can say that? I actually have four fathers because I have a heavenly father as well. But my... <laughs> My, my, my dad, one of the things I just love about my dad, Richard, is that he's a hugger. He just raised me that way. Just like, you know, just, just big hugs, you know, not these like side, you know, like we do in church. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> no, but like a hug. My dad raised me. He just hugs me. He just hug, and I love that. He was always very physical and, and, and affirming in that way, which is great. Little, uh, boys need that. And um, that's one of the things I love about going to, like, m many ethnic churches. Not all of them, but, like, a good Hispanic church. They'd be like, oh, the preacher, come here. <laughs> you know, you're just like... <laughs> the big Hispanic lady. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, anyway, so the father, I can just see this in my mind's eye. You know, the father falls on his neck, and he's like, my boy. And he's just like, the son's like. But this, this is not going at all how the son had planned. This is not going at all how the son had thought. It, the son had his speech, right? And he, so he starts the speech, right? Imagine that he'd written it on his hand. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Then the second part. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so I can just imagine here, as, as he's getting, he's like getting shaken, and then he's like, Father, <laughs> I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Look at what happens. Every detail is important, so watch this. Verse 21, and the son said to, the, said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay, so part A, he got part A out. Right? Is that right? But what, what did part B say? Yeah, make me like a servant. But you know what happens? Look at verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring, uh, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. What didn't he say? He never got to say it. He never said it. 
Which makes you wonder, is Jesus, is he reckless in his storytelling? Why did he leave that part out? Why did Jesus include that detail when the boy was back here sitting and pondering about how he would go back? There were two parts. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Right? Why did Jesus include the make me like one of your hired servants detail if he never gets to say it? For this reason, he wanted you to know the attitude with which he was returning. He's returning with a particular perspective. I'm going back as a servant, and I will, I will work. I will what? That's what servants do. I will work, and I will win myself into the good graces of my father. The son probably thought that the transaction would go something like this. He makes his way down to the house, and the father comes out and says, What are you doing here? <laughs> well, Dad, I've just... Um, don't call me Dad. Sir... I have, uh, I've, I've, I've been away. Yeah, I've, I, you've been away. We, I've been getting reports. You've been away. You're out of money, aren't you? You need a job. Dad, I know you're upset, but I have, I, I have sinned against heaven, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You can say that again. I have sinned against heaven, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then he would have said, but I have an idea. I have an idea. Make me like a hired servant. And the dad was said, that's not a bad idea. We can work with that. And then the son would have said, I've drawn up a contract here. Here it is, dad. Um, I, this is just a suggestion. I, w you know, I would start as a servant. These would be my hours and you know, wage. And I'd just like to, maybe I could live in the servant's quarters out here. And uh, then maybe after a while, no rush, I could you know, maybe move here into the house and I could... In Anyway, there's a, there's, a, there's a proposal here, and would you just, could you just take a look at it? And Dad said, uh, yeah, I'll have my legal team take a look at this. Um, you go ahead and you camp on the hill over there, and uh, we'll, we'll be in t I'll text you. We'll be in touch. Right? I mean, I don't know how the son thinks it's going to go, but clearly he thinks this is going to be like a country. This is going to be a working, a servant master, a worker employer relationship because that's, that's part of his speech, but he never gets that part out. Jesus tells us this the, the, the perspective that he had here, the A and the B part I've sinned against heaven and against you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He wants you to know the attitude with which he's returning, but that part never gets out. Now, this is where the story gets amazing because the older brother shows up. And you might have thought, as I thought, that the, the older brother and the younger brother could not have been different or could not have been more different. I mean, one was faithful and stayed around and continued to work and he was the good, wholesome, golden boy. And the other was the black sheep of the family that went off and wasted all of his living. These are two totally different boys. No, watch what happens. Very interesting thing happens. So they're having this party, verse 25. It says, Now as his older son was in the field, he came and he drew near to the house and he heard the music and dancing. So, is there a party? Is this somebody's birthday? What's going on here? Verse 26, So he called one of the servants and he, he, he asked him, What's going on? What, what do these things mean? And, and the servant said to him, Your brother has come. Uh, and because he, your father, has received him safe and sound, he's killed the fatted calf. Your, your brother's back. Yeah, he's back. He looks terrible. He's back. I mean, it looks like he's been through the ringer. But your brother's back. You're not going to believe it. It's just absolutely, completely, oh, I can't, can you believe it? And looking at the older brother, thinking that there would be a happiness and so He's not happy. He, he senses that he's not happy. Now watch this. Verse 28, but, what, but he was angry and he would not go in. Right? He's really angry. He's not going to the party. You know you're angry if you're not going to the party. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. I just see this in my mind's eye. The servant is saying, go tell my dad. Tell my dad I'm not going in there. Go tell dad I want to talk to him. So the servant's like, but it's your brother. Your brother's back. He's, he's alive. And he, Go tell my dad. Okay. So he goes into the party and there's music and there's dancing and everybody's having a good time and it's celebration because the lost is found and that which is dead is alive. And, and so the boy comes up, uh, the, the servant comes up to the dad and says, hey, you're... Your, your oldest son's here. Roger's here. We'll call him Roger. Roger's here. He's outside. And he says, um, oh, Roger's here. Great. Tell him to come in. Tell him Randy's home. Randy's home. He, he, he's mad. Oh, we're all glad. We're all... <laughs> tell him to come in. Tell him to come... 
No, he's mad. He doesn't want to come in. Mad? Yeah, he won't come into the party. So he has to leave the party and go out. And then you have this second conversation. Now again, you think these are two totally different people. There's the prodigal, the black sheep, and there's the faithful golden boy. But watch what happens. He goes out. Uh, verse 28. He was angry and he would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, because his father's like, hey, Randy's home. Come on, Raj. Come, it's your brother. Come, come in. Watch this. Now watch what, his, watch what the older brother says. Lo. These many years, Dad, I have been serving you. These many years, he says, I have been what? Serving you, and I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as, not my brother, this son of yours... As soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And, and this is amazing. So basically what he says is, I've been serving you all these years. Well, fun, funnily enough, that was exactly the posture of the prodigal. These aren't, these aren't two totally different boys. These are boys with two different experiences, but with the exact same attitude. The younger boy came back and he thought... I will be a servant and win myself by my work into my father's good graces. I'll be a servant. He thought he was a servant, but his father reminded him, you're a son. You're a son. The servants are the servants, but you're a son. Right? And here, all the while, in his own house, working with him day in and day out, apparently unbeknownst to the father, when the son finally gets it off his chest, the older son, when he gets it off his chest, Dad, I've been serving you all these... The father said, what? What, what did you say? All these years I've been serving you. Son? You've been what? You wouldn't even give me a small goat to celebrate with my friends. Now watch what the dad says. Jesus was a master storyteller. Son, son, he says. Son, you're always with me. And all that I have is yours. You think you're a servant? You think you just want a little goat? This whole place is yours. The whole thing is yours. It belongs to you. Here the boy was living in the house of his father as a servant. Didn't realize, I'm really a son. Wasn't taking full advantage of all the opportunities and, and, and beauties and glories and, and that, were, that were his as a son. So both the, 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 prodigal sheep, uh, the prodigal black sheep who had left and the golden boy who had remained home, both of them had the same... And this is actually Jesus' point, by the way. Both of them had the same attitude toward God. I'm a servant. And in the story, Jesus wants to make the point very clear. No, you're not. You're a son. You're a son. You're a son. This story, more than any other single story that Jesus told, encapsulates the, the totality, not just of what Jesus has done for you and 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 me, but what Jesus has done for the earth. He is calling us back to himself, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And he is saying to them, come on, Sure, there is a sense in which God is sovereign. God is God, and, and we are his servants. There's a sense in which that's true. Jesus himself said, John 15, 15, No longer do I call you servants, because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. And I've told you everything that my father has told me. I call you friends. Listen to the relational language here. I call you friends, Jesus says in John 15. And here in Luke 15, he says, You're not a servant. You're my son. God is the God of new starts, starting over, starting fresh. And by the way, all of the symbolism there, all of the symbolism there is exactly that. When it says robe on him, the robe was a sense that was a, was, was a, a standing. It was a robe of standing. 
And when he put the sandals on his feet, it was a sense of standing. When he put the ring on his finger, it wasn't for mere decoration. It was a sense of standing. It may well have been a signet ring. That is to say, a ring by which you can make official decisions. And he's uh, 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 on, on what grounds? On what, what has he done to earn this? What has he done to deserve this? Nothing. Well, how does he get it then? Because the Father is so good. Now, I want to close by taking you to one of my favorite passages. I gave you one of my favorite passages in, in the writings of Jesus, or the, the, speakings of, the, the sayings of Jesus. Now, the writings of Paul. This will take two seconds. Colossians, and then we wrap this up. We land this plane and we land this series. Look at Colossians chapter 3. This is pure glory. Colossians chapter 3. Look at this. Paul is writing to the church in Colossae and he says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things that are above. I'm in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Now look at verse 3. He says, for you died. For you died. When Paul is writing to believers who have put their faith in Christ and who have been baptized, he can say, for you died. That old you? No, we're, we're new. You've been born again. He says, for you died, past tense. Now watch this. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Present tense, is hidden. And then verse 4. And when Christ who is our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. Future tense, don't miss it. You know what he's saying? It's so beautiful. He's saying, you died. When you put your faith in Christ, the death that you deserved was the death that Jesus actually died. By the way, the ceremony, the New Testament ceremony, which is another example of how God gives us something to look back on. I was baptized June 6, 1996. I can remember that date just like that. There's just a few dates that I remember. My birth date, my marriage, and my baptism. June 6, 1996. I remember that date. That was the beginning of a new life for me. Paul writes to the believer and he says, when you were baptized, he says, you died. For you died. But then he says, even those of us that are baptized, it doesn't mean we're absolutely perfect. We might fall. We might fail. We might, we might stumble as the just man falls seven times and gets back up again. So he says, in the meantime, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You're okay. Right now, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And there, here's an amazing point. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve ran from God. But what Paul is saying, by the way, this is the whole purpose of when Moses went into the cleft of the rock, when he was hit in the cleft of the rock. The rock is Christ. The story here is that God is not someone to run from. He's not someone to hide from. He's someone to run to and to hide in. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. The father in the prodigal son wasn't somebody to run from. He was somebody to run to and somebody who was running back in the same direction, in, toward you. And then he says... And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you'll be with him in glory, your future. You know what he says? Your past is taken care of, for you died. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. Your present is secure. And then he says, and when Christ, who is your life, appears, you'll be with him in glory. Your future is guaranteed. I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that. He's the God of new starts. He's an amazing God. We've asked questions. Who is this God? Does God exist? What is the Bible? Why do innocent children suffer? And the beautiful picture of Scripture all boils down to one basic theme. For the believer, your past is taken care of, your present is secure, and your future is guaranteed because God is so good. Say it with me. God is love. Can you say amen? Beloved, how many of you want to say with me today, that's, a, that's an offer I can accept. I can accept that my past is taken care of, that my present is secure, and my future is guaranteed because of how good God is in Christ.